Our next speaker is an author from Austin, Elizabeth Crook. She's written three novels, The Raven's Bride and Promised Lands, were published by Doubleday. And Elizabeth has written for periodicals such as Texas Monthly and the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. Has served on the Council of the Texas Institute of Letters. She is a member of the Western Writers of America and the Texas Philosophical Society and was selected the honored writer for 2006 Texas Writers Month joining previous honorees O. Henry, J. Frank Doby, John Graves, Larry McMurtry, Cormac McCarthy, Catherine Ann Porter, Elmer Kelton, Liz Carpenter, Sarah Bird, James Michener, and Horton Foote. Kill me now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Crook. You're in good company. That's, that's quite, a, quite a group. Um, up to the last minute, I had not thought through what I was going to read tonight, and Bill Sibley was very politely pressing me to let him know what it would be so that he could get it on the agenda. And I had a memory that Dobie had written some really great letters to Bertha. So in order to get Bill off my back, I emailed him and said, I'm going to read Dobie's letters to Bertha. And Bill said, that's great. And then I emailed Steve Davis, who wrote the really wonderful biography of Dobie that you'll see for sale here, and he's a friend of mine, and um, I asked him if, if he, sorry, if he could point me in the direction of the best Doby to Bertha letters. I secretly figured that he would just give me the page numbers out of the biographies, and I could flip to those pages and read, but here's what his return email said. Wow, Elizabeth, you sure know how to stake out a difficult project for yourself. I began checking into the Bertha Frank correspondence after our conversation and was reminded pretty quickly why I had wanted to forget it. Uh, after finishing that book. Here at the Whitliff, we have hundreds and hundreds of their letters in several file folders, almost all of them undated and written in Dobie's very difficult to read chicken scratch. He wrote her at least every day, if not more often, when they were apart. But our group of Dobie letters is nothing compared to what the HRC has. That uh, They have between 50 and 75 boxes of Dobie Bertha correspondence, a gold mine or some kind of mine. The subject heading of this email was Doby Can of Worms. So to cut this short, I have, I've tried to pick out um, letters that are especially revealing and characteristic of Doby's adoration and very deep respect for Bertha. I won't have time to give you a lot of background on the letter, so please just roll with each excerpt and consider it a little isolated gem of prose from a truly masterful storyteller. Now, is that echo horrible or is it okay? Can you hear kind of a a hum or anything? It's okay? All right. Um, okay, in this letter, Dobie is 25 years old. He is courting Bertha. He writes to her from the family ranch near Beeville describing the ranch. He explains that the, county, that the county is more settled than it used to be, but still, he says, for which I reverently thank God the coyotes howl. I can hear them now. The ranch is 30 miles due west of Beeville. It is traversed by a creek which is so crooked that one is always in doubt whether he is on this side or the other side. Also, the Arroyo Largo runs by the old house, and it is the dry branch that Elrich and I used to like to swim on horseback when it got up after a big rain. The ranch is transfixed by 10,000 prickly pear and other kinds of thorns. The sun stands immediately over it at noon, from 10 o'clock until 5 o'clock every day from May until September but the moon shines there better than anywhere else on the dry land between the Fort Davis Mountains and the Jacksonville Pines. There are more stars visible through one rift in the branches of the old oak back of the barn than from all the roof gardens in New York City. It is generally so dry that the crickets get hoarse from thirst. These are all the ge geographical facts I can think of about the place, which I have so often blessed in absence and damned in presence. In 1916, when Dobie was 28 years old, he was irritated that he was assigned to teach English 1 instead of English 2. He says, I am the best teacher in the University of Texas. I have more originality than any man I know. I publish nothing. I have no PhD. Therefore, I am fit only for freshman rhetoric. Curse business. Curse politics. Curse the materialistic world as I may. 
There is in it nothing so ludicrously pedantic, unfair, and puerilely narrow as the petty jealousies and spelling bee standards of judgment to be found in academic circles. That same year, Bertha suggested that maybe he shouldn't marry her, but instead go to New York to write. He had two objections to the idea. One, if he gave up teaching to write, then the last place he would choose to live would be New York. I have no interest in either the four million or the four hundred, nor am I so far gone in succumbance to banality to follow the unnumbered herd of sociology, fiction and pornographic, playwriters who have made ridiculous that city with themselves. I should go where the winds blow strong, the blood is red, and the world is new, to the south countries, where even now the revolution of Nicaragua makes the blood thunder in my temples. His second objection was simply that he was bound and determined to marry her no matter what she suggested. Although I am selfish and hard enough, God knows I love you, and I want you more than I want any other one thing or all other things put together. Swift could kill two women because marriage interfered with his business. Ibsen trampled down old friendships for the sake of his art. I may be unable to succeed. I may grievously disappoint you. Nevertheless, I want you and I am not afraid to try with you. This was written a few months later, after he had been working uh, with cattle all night. I like to be down in this country where I know everybody and like people and where I am greeted with como te vas, Pancho. I can make money now and I may go back within two weeks for some more cattle. I had a thousand times rather do this work than teach the stupid summer school, so do not worry about me. Last night, as I rode alone on top of the cars, I thought of you. I have a glorious beard, and I wondered if you would kiss me. I love you, Frank. On getting to Austin, he wrote, I have a wonderful coat of tan, smooth and dark, like the furtive glance of some South Country murderer and lover. I have on a fresh Palm Beach suit, and I shall steal a Shasta Daisy on the way and wear it. Two days before his wedding, he wrote this, I shall see you tomorrow. I shall marry you the day after tomorrow. These facts overwhelm all else. Do not be afraid of me, darling little woman. I shall be good to you, Frank. When they were newlyweds and he was away uh, serving in World War I, he wrote this. God knows I want to go home to you, but it is bitter to have trained so much and to have come so far with these motives and feelings and then to be failed of one single battery volley into the Hun ranks. I think I should be ashamed when I get back, never having endured one hardship or fought one fight. But darling, I am infinitely longing for you tonight, homesick for you. I could shut my eyes and imagine my arms about you, and both your dear hands at home. And perhaps you would be in my warm, snug, in the, in the warm, snug, closed up things I sent you. But even then a hand of mine should be warm inside. Good night, sweetheart. I love you a million, million loves. Do not work too hard, please. And do buy plenty to eat, especially chocolate and grapes and grapefruit, Frank. This from France. When I get discharged, I am going to set about making money so that you and I will not have to live amid the banalities of the Lone Star State, the dimensions of which, as the crusaders of that state over here are fond of boasting, exceed those of France. Infinitely dismal, degrading, and disgusting is it to languish thus for weeks in utter uselessness though well, in utter idleness, though drawing the same money as the man giving up his life on the battlefield, in expectation, though wholly powerless to consummate the realization thereof. I think of you at all hours, and I want to be by your side more than I can tell. Oh, I wish I know, knew how you are. After the war, when he was back in Texas, he was happy to be on horseback again. Um, I do not know whether I enjoy reading more or riding alone horseback. I positively care nothing for riding in an automobile. Its sole use is to convey me promptly. I mildly enjoy riding with the cowboys after cattle occasionally. I am mighty proud of roping wild hogs. What I like best is going out alone, best with the dogs, taking my lunch, unsaddling, and enjoying the lunch all the more for watching the horse enjoy his. There is in the country uh, there is the country to look at, the hills, the brush, the cattle. There are some deer, perhaps some rattlesnakes. I kill two or three every day. 
maybe a wild hog. I was alone yesterday without dogs, and I roped, marked, and cut two immense wild boars. When the cattle business started going downhill in the early 20s, Debbie uh, went back to teaching. While I'm in one world, it is forever my fate to hear the music of the other. In the university, I am a wild man. In the wilds, I am a scholar and a poet. It is terrible for you to be married to such a man. Now, in closing, I'm going to move forward a lot of years to um, after the end of World War II. Dobie was in Nuremberg during the war criminals trial, and he wrote about the trial. He went on to give talks in Bremen and to lecture in Copenhagen, and he wrote Bertha that once he got back to Frankfurt, he was going to ask for a discharge um, with the hope of coming home soon. I feel I have done whatever bit of good I could do over here, and I'm through with seeing the country. I don't want to write a book about the scene. I have been utterly disillusioned by Russia. I think I have. I see no hope for a better world except by long, long processes of communism into something else. I don't think anything can stop Russia if she is going to use just brute force. Conflict will bring more misery, and misery succumbs to communism. I'll just quit trying to save the world and write about my old friends, the coyotes. There's one last thing I'd like to share that he wrote, not to Bertha, though she was the one to find it, um, it was in the papers that she went through after his death, an epitaph that he had written for himself. He loved life and put a few fragments of it into writing. Because of deference to the well-mannered, he failed to expose most of what he knew, enjoyed, and hated. He achieved a liberated mind. Realizing that all gods and Bibles are man-made, he had contempt for all creeds and admiration for nobilities and sensible skepticisms. His faith in the geological processes of the universe, including the speck called Earth, was, like literature, a solace to him.